Today's episode of Data Driven is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash data driven. Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. So hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all the things that are empowering the data revolution. If you think of data as the new oil, data science and analytics, the new refineries, then you can consider us Car Talk because we talk about where data meets the road. So with me on this journey, as always, is my favorite data philosopher, Andy Leonard. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, this is a bit of a different uh, show. As you see, we've been very experimental, and so far our experiments have worked. Uh, and that's a good part of any scientific endeavor, including data science. Uh, so this is just kind of uh, Andy and I talking about uh, philosophizing uh, about data. Uh, and I'm, I want to call this this episode Fear and Loathing in Data Science. I think that's a good title. It is, uh, because there's a lot of confusion in the data science world, um, not amongst the data scientists themselves or, or people in this space, but people on the periphery, for sure, and definitely people on the outside, like, like business users. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what they want to do uh, or who they are and what they can do. Um, and um, so I, I think it's, it's an apt title. It's also a title of one of the talks I gave in St. Louis uh, about a month ago. Awesome. Uh, which was basically... The theme of the talk, you know, aside from being related to the Hunter Thompson book and movie of the same similar name, uh, was, you know what, you can do data science. Sure. It's not this mystical, magical thing. Um, you don't have to be a unicorn. And even unicorns didn't start off as unicorns. They started off as baby unicorns. So <laughs> that's, uh, that, that, I mean, that was kind of the thing. And, 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 and some of the best feedback I get when I, when I present is always, you know, you inspired me to do this. That's awesome. Um, and I've got a number of that. And I did, a, I did a similar talk kind of with a more of a civic tech IoT theme for uh, in Virginia Beach at uh, Kevin's... Um, Revolution Conference. It was an awesome conference. I, yeah. I, I, I was a last-minute backfill uh, for a speaker because I ran out of time to do the request for papers. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> but I was able to go down there, and they have a really great show. Um, I encourage you, Andy, to... To submit a, a talk there next year. Oh, I'll have um, to do it. Thank you. It was awesome. And then uh, I recently spoke at another event in Chevy Chase about, uh, you know, using Excel. Um, and I wanted to call the presentation Excel as the gateway drug for data science. <laughs> but the organizers didn't really like the theme of that. So I had to, um, um, <laughs> I had to walk back on that. But, yeah, I'm uh, just sitting here thinking, editors, they're everywhere. <laughs> they are everywhere. They are. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're they just ruin the fun. <laughs> so you are currently in Ireland, and I'm currently in Maryland. And by the magic of technology, it sounds like we're in the same room. Yes. And um, and why are you in Ireland, Andy? Do you just want to get a tour of the Guinness factory, or or what? Well, that's the real reason I came over. But you know, after I'd planned to make that trip. No, really, I was, um, I'm actually doing a class on business intelligence markup language, which is a way to do automation for what we call data integration, uh, data wrangling, munging. And um, I'm focused on making that faster and easier, improving the quality of it. I'm doing that class next week. Um, the organizers of SQL Saturday Dublin learned I was coming over. They said, hey, we're having a SQL Saturday, the the Saturday before your Monday class starts, since you're going to be in the area, why don't you pop over? And as part of that, we decided to do uh, the Thursday before, we decided to do a day-long pre-conference training on uh, intelligent data integrations. Talk I've been given for a little over a year now. And we did that at Microsoft Dublin yesterday. Very cool. Yeah, it's been nice. It was a huge honor, very humbling to be asked. And um, had a great crowd yesterday. Um, that's one of the reasons why my voice sounds like it does today. I've been, I talked all day yesterday. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I sound like Kermit the Frog if he were from Huntsville, Alabama or, or something. Uh, or Farmville. 
Now, or Farmville, Virginia. That's true. But no, it's been great. Um, we, we, you know, we, I'm looking forward to chatting with you some more about the state of the show, data driven. And um, I hope folks enjoy what we have to say. Awesome segue. Um, Definitely. And I think, depending on how iTunes ranks it, we're 140, 155. Oh, wow. Yeah, on Tech News. My goodness. How did that happen so fast? <laughs> I think I think the way they rank it, from what I can tell, has to do with number of downloads in, in the last number of, of days. Okay. And there is no substitute for frequent content. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the one thing. I mean, it's just, um, you know, I like to think it's because we're going viral that our traffic is like, you know, doubling in velocity. But um, which I think there is some of that. But the fact that we're push, pushing out content now. It's been 21 days. We have 16 episodes. Yeah. Wow. And this will and be, this will be number what? 17. Number 17. Right. Wow. Now, I don't know how we're going to number the shows longer term, but that's a, that's a good problem to have. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you know, the big metrics just kind of looking at right now, I'm, I'm sitting in Ireland uh, over here. It is just past six o'clock. Um, on uh, Friday, June 16th, 2017. And we're sitting here. We, we launched. What was the date we launched? It was in May. It was, it was three weeks ago. 21 three days ago. Three weeks ago. ago. Mm -hmm. Sitting here looking at the podcast statistics. And the one that jumps out at me is uh, the last seven days, uh, over a thousand. Right. It just blows my mind because it was, it was what, a week ago? We were talking about all time our all time downloads being at a thousand and that took that took about two weeks right and now our last seven day number is over a thousand so Pretty i am cool. uh, I, i'm very honored very humbled um it's uh it's been a very interesting ride thus far uh, <laughs> and um yeah, I'm over here. I'm looking forward to talking to people at SQL Saturday Ireland um, tomorrow. And I'm presenting for the last slot of the day, so I'll have plenty of time to wander around and uh, meet some of the interesting, neat folks. And I may do, Frank, I may do more than one. Dude, I was just about to say that. You, 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 um, <laughs> you read my mind. I was like, you know, why do just one? I mean, uh, you know, there, there's no, um, uh, there's no rules to podcasting. I mean, there's, just, I mean, obviously we don't want to put out a lot of junk, but I think if it's quality material, there's no good reason to wait. I mean, uh, particularly the data points, um, and, and things like that. I mean, it, it, they are meant to be kind of improv off the cuff. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the background on the first one, um, um, was, uh, I was in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Uh, so if you're a fan of Rolling Rock beer in the U.S., that's where it originated. It's not made there anymore, unfortunately. Um, but, um, yeah, I was my, my little one. He's two and a half, and he was being a rambunctious little kid. And um, he was kicking a soccer ball around, so I just was following him. And then, you know, I kind of had this thought, you know, they had a thing on the loudspeaker about uh, – it was either a loudspeaker or a poster talking about, you know – advancing science and my first thought was oh that's the type of stuff lynn is doing right <laughs> and then i realized like wait a minute like for the first time you know uh at, at, you know my my mother-in-law died of cancer some 15 years ago so i never actually met my mother-in-law so that's that's how we go so every time i you know since i met my wife you know i've been going to this every year i never really felt like i could do anything to help other than you know walk around in the laps and stuff like that and i'm not saying that's not nothing but you sure. know um, but I mean, having kind of the impact that data science is having on, you know, cancer research, which is not something that I don't think, you know, most people would necessarily think of right off the bat. When they think of data science, they tend to think of data visualization or, you know, how do you get somebody to click on something like, um, I mean, that sort of thing. It's, it's, so, I mean, to be able to be part of that and impactful, I mean, that's, that inspired me and I was, that's when I, I just pulled out the phone and just said, you know, and then, you know, 90 seconds while I was watching my little one. Yeah. And if you look on, if you look in the video that was streamed live to Facebook, 
I'm not sure if it made it to our YouTube channel too, but um, you can see my eyes going like, uh oh, like, <laughs> what's he doing? That's dangerous. Because <laughs> there was like these little bleachers, and he was trying to climb up them and jump off them. Oh, that's and, just uh, being a boy. Goodness. Oh yeah, totally, totally. And this kid has no fear, like zero fear at all. So he, so that's why you look at my eyes. I'm like, you know. I'm thinking, oh, well, no, I'm going to have to cut this short real quick or there's going to be a terrible blooper reel. So then I realized, well, wait a minute, if I post to Facebook, you know, I have the audio. Um, right. It would make for great content. And I looked at the stats. I mean, uh, you know, it's been very well received uh, in terms of uh, how it's been shared across Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, as well as how, how well it's been downloaded. So I thought it was just an interesting, you know, it was a data point, right? <laughs> that was it, really it the... was. That was a great name. You came up for it. I, I should say I, I have five children, three daughters and two sons. And I, I think um, I think my daughters may have actually been more rambunctious and climbing and being fearless than my sons were. And that's saying something. But, wow. Um, yeah. That show, tying into that uh, that event, into that show with Lynn, where she spoke so much about her work, that um, where she worked with bioinformatics people and, and teams, and she told that awesome story about the worker who was diagnosed with prostate cancer, pretty much, you know, uh, given a life sentence at that point, and, and not a long one, and um, had the opportunity to resequence uh, the DNA for the uh, for the cancer, and learned no, he didn't have the cancer they thought he had, <laughs> and he wasn't going to die shortly. And that's just an amazing story. My gosh! I mean, talk about taking your health into your own hands. I mean, yeah, and that's something that data, you know, that the work that he was doing in data uh, and bioinformatics. I mean, that that enabled that. Yeah. You know, he just didn't sit there and, you know, kudos to him. I mean, he just didn't sit sure. there and, and mope about it. Um, and he just said he probably did mope about it and was probably at his desk. And, yeah. then he, you know, I'd love to get the guy on the show um, uh, at some point. But, I mean, he was probably just sitting at his desk and was like, he probably looked around his office because, wait a minute. <laughs> Isn't this what we do? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when you're given a death sentence like that, I mean, you, you, there's probably very much a, I'm sure, a slew of emotions. But one of them at some point is probably being like, well, what's it going to do? Kill me? You know? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, you know, along with that, um, Lynn also shared, and I thought this was also cogent. And at the time, they were debating in, uh, in Washington, D.C., U.S. legislation around whether or not to allow insurance companies access to your DNA um, if you'd had it sequenced and whether they could charge a premium if you didn't allow them access to it. That was actually on the floor, I believe, of the house um, while, you know, that week we were doing that show. And she was talking about how she had advised her daughter not to get her DNA sequenced, although Lynn herself had done it. Right. And um, I mean, that's those debates are going to be very interesting for yeah. a number of reasons. I mean, there's a number of ethical reasons where you can say that's a terrible idea. Right. There's a number of reasons to think why that's a good idea. Sure. Um, but, you know, having worked on K Street myself, um, <laughs> I'm not optimistic about the right thing being done. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I actually live just outside Washington, D.C., so... Uh, and I'm I'm a little bit closer to the sausage factory. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've worked there, Frank. I mean, that was your that was your job for the last several months. I know. Uh, last two years at Microsoft, yeah, I was I was doing technology evangelism for uh, government affairs. So yeah, yeah. Uh, met some real. I mean, lots of smart people there, despite what people think. Lots of people that I think go there to, you know, make changes in the world, positive changes in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also kind of, you know, politics is politics, you know, it's kind of a take no prisoners type of sport and, um, you know, bad things can come of that and good things can come of it too from time to time, but those accidents are not really frequent. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you characterized it as an accident. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying it's not like that movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Is that what you're saying, Frank? I'm saying it's like that. It's more like, um, 
It's kind of the average between uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and House of Cards. It's maybe oh. not as sinister as House of Cards, but uh, it's they're certainly not as optimistic or, or you know, feel good uh, hit of the, you know, like a feel good movie like sure. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. But uh, Sure. So uh, you mentioned House of Cards. I have a friend who's actually been an extra in the latest season. And, oh, very um, cool. Yeah, her name's Gretchen. I won't say her last name, but Gretchen was in the scene. She was in a very, uh, it was just her. Um, and another, like, I guess, background actor. I don't know what the official title is of that. And, um, you know, and, and, and the main character there, uh, Frank. So nice. uh, Frank Underwood. And it's when he's walking in the hall, speaking to the audience, which I love those scenes. And oh, yeah. The fourth wall kind of. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's really he's, cool. he's there right before he walks into the uh, to the inaugural ball. And there's a couple that walk by him and Gretchen is the lady that's in the couple there in that scene. So pretty interesting stuff, but, you know, kind of getting back to some of the shows and, you know, and all the downloads. Um, and, and I, 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 I'm floored by the downloads. Frank. I just, um, the, you know, the numbers are, are awesome. And, um, again, very humbled, very honored that folks are, are listening. Um, we, we talked with, uh, with Donald Farmer. Um, we had a really good talk with him about his company, uh, Tree Hive, but we also got into some other interesting topics there. Just, um, he, Donald brought up, a, a, you know, an interesting line about how blockchain is being used. The old Bitcoin, you know, security model is now being used to combat um, essentially economic slavery. And, um, because it's public, because it can't be altered, you know, for all intents and purposes. I, I read a couple of articles describing what it would take to hack blockchain, and it seems pretty hard to do. Uh, not impossible, probably, but, but very difficult to do. But they're doing things like tracking the flow of, uh, of money through, say, uh, a project to, to build a bridge. And there are people who have immigrated uh, you know, to, to work on those projects and then they're being paid uh, some wage and usually there's subcontractors in the mix and the whole idea behind the blockchain to combat the economic slavery is that all of that information is stored in blocks in the blockchain and what we see is how much money actually makes it down to the person who's maybe maybe traveled into a foreign country to work on uh, this public project, how much of that money gets to them, and then maybe even how much that they're able to get back home to to people, because economics drive a lot of immigration. I mean, we we see a lot in the news about um, about uh, immigration on you know just because people are scared, they're in fear of their lives, um, and that's valid. And I'm not trying to take away anything from that, but there's a lot of it that's just people trying to you know, survive, pay their bills. Uh, yeah. Or just seek a better life for their, for their children and grandchildren. I mean, yeah. You know, two of my four grandparents were not born in the United States. Wow. And, uh, you know, they, they left some pretty, you know, one case it was, you know, just strictly economic. It was a great depression. There was nowhere to go. And the other, the other was kind of, you know, economics and kind of, you know, political situation. And they just said, you know what? Don't need this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't want my children, you know, continuing to grow up in this. And, uh, you know, there's got to yeah. be a better place to go. And I mean, it's just, but yeah, I mean, it, people underestimate. I mean, and, and the other thing too, is I think a lot of people, the, the immigration debate in the, the States has lost all forms of sanity or civility. And that's yeah. a conversation for another day. Yes. But um, it's not strictly an American story. I mean, if you look at Dubai, um, yeah. a lot of the uh, skyscrapers, airports, and all the, the crazy stuff they're building in Dubai, I mean, that's, they're not built by locals. They're built by folks who come in from India, typically. Right. And um, I think the one of the examples that Donald gave in the um, interview was an airport um, somewhere in Dubai or somewhere like that. I mean... Mm -hmm. um, if a lot of shenanigans, you know, go down in the U.S. where there's a, you know, an active press, there's freedom of the press and fairly open in terms of, you know, what you can say and what you can't say. 
as opposed to, you know, the other extreme, maybe North Korea. I mean, <laughs> um, there's definitely, you know, if, if bad things can happen in, in this type of environment. Bad things are going to happen in other types of environments, too. Exactly. And maybe worse things. Probably worse things or more often, um, yeah. you know. This whole blockchain technology being you know, completely repurposed. No one thought of this as a use for it. Um, just, just phenomenal. And, it's really uh, interesting where blockchain is appearing. So yeah. um, on the June 15th um, show of um, Data Science Daily, and we'll talk about that next because we didn't really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cover that. Um, um, there was actually IBM and AIG have um, teamed up and they're using blockchains uh, for multinational insurance policies. Wow. And uh, it's a pretty interesting story uh, about how, you know, you have the kind of the parent policy, which could be in the UK, yeah. and, you know, child policies, you know, various countries. I think the case study was Singapore, the US and Kenya um, and how they were all able to be kept up to date in terms of what's happening on the policy. The other thing that um, came up on a conversation I had the other day was blockchain is being used to verify the authenticity of data sets. Um, and in such a way that so if you, you know, say I say I'm a large government entity or some, some corporate entity, I have a large data set, I want to expose it publicly. Yeah. How do you know that somebody, some malicious party hasn't altered that data set? Right. You know, say no. it's, um, I have to be careful. I have to be careful what example I use, but let's just say I have a, um, I have a Weimar honor who gets into a lot of trouble, right? So let's say I had a large data set, you know, totaling all the bad things she's done. Um, <laughs> uh, what if she got her, her paws on it, so to speak, and decided to say, you know, reduce the cost of, you know, every damaged thing that she's done, whether it's her dog crate, you know, um, she stole a piece of steak last night off the stove. Um, right. So what if, you know, she changed the data set to say, no, 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 it wasn't, you know, it wasn't filet mignon. It was, it was bologna, right. Or something cheaper. Right. Um, how do you know that something altered? So the yeah. integrity of data is, it, you know, could be called into the question. Um, but the interesting thing about that is, you know, we're talking about some of these data sets could be, you know, very large. I mean, impossibly large, you know, by 2017 standards. Right. Um, how do you verify that? How do you, how do you know that the data has not been tampered? So one of the thing that's, uh, that I've, that I've heard about is um, using blockchain to track kind of the transactions against that data set and, and, and to show, I don't know all the mechanics yet. And I love to get this guy uh, on the show as a guest to talk about it, but this yeah. is very much cutting edge where you can, you can do that. Um, where you can use blockchain to to guarantee the integrity of data. And I think that has some interesting applications, not just in terms of sample data sets, but in other ways too. Um, Absolutely. It's just fascinating what's going on in that space. I, I want to know more, but it is a very transaction-friendly um, solution. I mean, that's what it was designed for. And, you know, when you talk about relational data, we talk about ACID and you know, we want uh, atomicity, we want consistency, we want isolation, we want durability. And blockchain, you know, manages all of that. And apparently it does a fantastic job of it. And it, you know, it does it by, by you know, multiple copies of itself live out there. And that's one of the reasons that makes it hack resistant. I won't say hack proof, but, you know, if you've got to modify, um, you know, hundreds of files say at the same time in the same way um, for this to take without producing uh, whatever you know some kind of uh, redundancy check violation um, that is a very interesting solution it's not security through obscurity um, although that may come into play it's definitely uh, security just by by copying i guess <laughs> right it's massively parallel so yeah. it'd be really hard to Again, not impossible, but it'd be really hard to break that. Agreed. Because it's just so. And it, it's just a fascinating. It's a fascinating look, and 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 I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are you know large database vendors that are kind of working on finding ways they can integrate blockchain into their 
into their products. Yeah. Well, what are we up to now in data sizes? I mean, um, if we look at the global amount of data, isn't it measured in zettabytes now? <laughs> Something like that. I lost track after yottabytes. It just, <laughs> yeah, it's, crazy. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, in terms of what's possible. Um, right. And so we're talking about, you know, large subsets of data, which, you know, I remember when I started working in data, um, gigabytes was big data. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of survived the transition from gigabytes to terabytes. Um, and now terabytes of data is nothing. Um, you know, it's just right. normal. It's, um, you know, you know, it's not really a big deal. <laughs> yeah. and we had, we had a, a great talk. Our very first guest was Jen Underwood. That was a, that was a neat recording. Jen is uh, one of the sweetest people I know and scary smart, um, very gifted in data analytics and, um, you know, has helped, has really helped shape the industry. Um, I can't talk about all the things that I know she's helped with, but just take my word for it. She's the reason why some products have some features, and I'll just kind of leave it at that. <laughs> you looked her up on LinkedIn, and you can use your imagination to figure out what those products are. Um, <laughs> and the other thing, the other thing that's great about Jen is she she has an eye for visualization. Yeah, you know, she's one of those people. She she grocks the um, the data side of things, but she also gets the visualization side of things. Absolutely. Um, and if you go to her blog, uh, I mean, her blog is awesome. I mean, not just because it's visually stunning, but if you, um, you know, a, a, a mobile phone or tablet does not do her site justice, you have to see on a, on a, some form of desktop. Yeah. Because the animations that she has, her, I mean, that's the thing. I, I think I even, I, I, I had a fanboy moment on, on that <laughs> show where I was like, I mean, the animations on her site are just awesome. Yeah, you know, and 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 animation on the web is a very tricky business because um, yeah. you don't want to overdo it, and it's believe me, it's very easy to overdo it. Right. Um, but if you don't, there's a fine line between underdoing it where you don't notice it, and overdoing it between that's all you can notice to right. having it where it's right in that sweet spot um, of of adding value and entertainment, and yeah. and and she she nailed it. Like her website is, is, you know, the, you know, the benchmark in terms of how do you implement, implement animation on a website? I mean, it's just, it, yeah. I mean, perfect landing. Well, you know, you, you have a gift for that, Frank, you have a real knack for uh, visualization yourself. And, um, I know because I've known you for a dozen years and I've seen some of the cool stuff you've done with, uh, with visualization. And I will take credit for this. I, I don't know if you remember, but years ago I told you that you'd be really good at business intelligence because that's the deliverable for business intelligence. It's the chart. It's the report. And you want to communicate as, uh, as succinctly and as quickly as possible to someone. Uh, optimally, you want them to be able to glance at that report and get a sense of the state of whatever it is that report is reporting. No, exactly. 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 And, and reports, I think, so my background is a software engineer and, you know, I, I had a special, um, love for kind of building really good user interfaces and user experiences. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that's always amazed me is that reporting is typically the last part of an application or solution built. Right. Now, part of that, I think, is practical, right? So I'm on a project now where reporting literally was the last module because, you know, there was no way to enter data. Right. Um, until you have the user interface and the data model in the back end to, to store it. So, so sometimes I think by, by, by architectural reasons, it, it usually is last anyway. Um, but, you know, it should be last in order but not last in mind because ultimately the people who view the reports – are the people that cut your checks. <laughs> Most often, yeah. And from a business intelligence project perspective, Frank, and I've been on dozens of them, um, I, you know, if I had the authority while I was uh, on a project, if I was leading or just leading the BI portion of it, we designed the reports first, at least conceptually. And, you know, I've heard um, others in the field, like uh, Stacia Meisner, refer to this as right-to-left uh, design, where, you know, we're... We're in the Western hemisphere. We are, you know, Western cultures where we read left to right and top to bottom. 
And when you think about what a design would look like in a workflow, uh, you know, left would be the beginning and right would be the end of it. And in this case, the right side would be the reports. Well, while we start on that right, and do the right to left, at least conceptually, that we're focused on the right thing. That is the deliverable, is, um, you know, is that output. And as I said, you have a very keen eye for that. I, I know because I don't. And so I recognize <laughs> <laughs> when what other people do. So you, I, I'll, a short story, I, I designed a, um, a website once for a community project, and it started growing. It was actually doing pretty well, and I need to really get that back online again. But um and we got to the spot where it, you know, it could stand some redesign uh, for just for performance reasons. So um, I was working with a couple of people back then, and one of them was was good at this. They were really good at WordPress uh, stuff. And so I said, you know, take a look and tell me what you think. And this designer uh, got back with me and said, it looks like it was designed by an engineer. Now, <laughs> I, I am an engineer, so I took that as a compliment, but. It turns out, Frank, that that's not a compliment. <laughs> no, I don't think you meant it as a compliment, uh, or see, I don't think I don't think it was meant that way. It was, uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's something that you know. It was interesting in the um, late two thousand eight ish, two thousand seven. Microsoft really pushed the idea of a diviner, right? You know, yes. a developer designer, uh, or developer was the other one, designer developer. Um, which I, I, for me, I mean, it was like, it explained it. I mean, I, you know, had my parents not been so insistent that I be a, uh, some kind of engineer or doctor, uh, yeah. they would have tolerated lawyer, but you know, clearly, you know, I was going to be in one of the STEM fields, whether I wanted to or not. Right. Um, you know, I probably, you know, I, I did have a good eye for, for art. I wanted to be a graphic designer and this is in the, oh. the era before the web, um, being a digital immigrant, uh, as Mark Tabadillo says, um, you know, there was really not well-defined career paths for, for, you know, if you wanted to make good money, you know, whereas with engineering, it was a pretty solid bet still is. Right. Yeah. Um, but, um, there's definitely a, um, there's definitely a need for it because I mean, it, it used to be people would be willing to work around the computer, right? You think right. back to the mainframe days, right? People would put up with, you know, the green, um, the green screens, not the green screens like, you know, I have in my, my home studio, <laughs> but, you know, kind of the amber, you know, the, the text only displays. But, right. you know, as computers uh, become more ubiquitous and technology more personal, user experience really matters a lot more than it used to. Um, oh, so we're recording... We're recording this June sixteenth, and Twitter rolled out a new UI, and it's kind of ugly. I think <laughs> um, it's a little too radical of a change in too short of a time, but you yeah, know, it true. is what it is. So you know what'll happen? People will complain about it for a few days and then forget about it, just like the the new Instagram logo. Yeah, you know, was absolutely hideous, and then people are like, oh yeah, that's the new Instagram logo. Like, you, don't you remember complaining about that? Like, no. <laughs> This is how, you know, how different we see this. When I saw the new Twitter changes, I went, hey, that's pretty cool. And then <laughs> I saw people complaining about it. And I retweeted a few of them just because I thought what they were saying was funny. You know, I understood it. But my first reaction was, hey, different. <laughs> right, right. I, I had that reaction, too. And then, like, you know, on the app, I like the changes on the app. It's interesting, too, because it, it tells you that the mental modalities, right? The mm. app, I like the way the app on the iPhone works uh, and okay. looks now. But the website, it's just, I don't know. I don't know if it's, is it, is it a truly aesthetic opinion about the new look or is it just what I've been using for the last X number of years right. has changed? How much of that is, how much of that is, you know, an, an, uh, an art critic type <laughs> right. uh, opinion versus a comfort loss opinion. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's an interesting perspective too, because I, you know, I don't think that deeply about it. Um, I do. I, I know user uh, experience. Let me say that again. I know user experience is very important. I get the importance of it. It's, in my opinion, from the business intelligence slash data science perspective, it's the most important. And that's why we're seeing uh, data science attract all the attention that it is because of the visualizations. Um, but as we've talked about several times on the show, um, 
you, in order to get those visualizations, or at least to have them represent some accurate picture of the truth, you have to spend a lot of time. And in 2017, as we're recording this, it turns out to be most of the time in a data science project is spent uh, munging the data or wrangling or, you know, preparing and cleansing. And so we've had some, um, we've had some really good, good discussions about that. And I, you know, just kind of finishing up talking about Jen, she had a post after our recording. And I think maybe after the show was released where she talked about a CEO had uh, requested resumes and received uh, hundreds of resumes from data science people, but none of them, according to the CEO, understood uh, ETL or OLAP, and they really needed them to understand both of those technologies. Yeah, that's interesting, because I think uh, very similar to kind of the early days of the web, where there was, um, so my background was I, was, I was in Silicon Alley, just as the term Silicon Alley got its term, got that name. And I was the first webmaster at Barnes and Noble, what ultimately became BarnesandNoble.com. Wow. And um, webmasters at that time, we're talking 95, 96, um, there was a lot of debate. What are they? Are they developers? Are yeah. they Unix sysadmins, right? Yeah. Uh, are they infrastructure people? You know, what what is that? And I, I think we're very much in that same modality now. Like, what is a data scientist? You know, is yeah. it, um, you know, I like to look around on, on LinkedIn and kind of see, you know, where's the market hot? And it's just like, you know, a lot of the data science jobs are, you know, PhD only, PhD only. Right. It's like, I get why that might be a thing, um, but um, I don't think that's going to hold much longer. Um, and we've talked for this long and we've not made a movie reference, so I'm about to fix that. Um I would say that the, the image that comes to my mind when I think about this space here, this data science, data engineering, whatever you want to call it, space, um, is that of the part in World War Z where um, the, the first couple of zombies, they're, yeah. they're trying to rush the city. Uh, was it Jerusalem? Uh, and, um, uh, and they were trying to rush the city. And when they first figured out they can climb on top of one another, and then all of a sudden, the deluge, once they spilled over the wall, there was no stopping them. And I think right. we're kind of at that point now where um, there's going to be so much demand for uh, to have uh, data drive the business um, that the demand is just going to – it's already outstripping supply, right? I mean, PhD yeah. programs and universities can only um, produce so many mathematics and statistics PhD people at a time um, that those are not – those are not high volume producers. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of those folks may not have an interest in kind of working in, in the business world. Um, they may prefer to stay in research and, and academia. Sure. So there's the, there's already a shortage and, you know, uh, the, the folks that, that can do it who don't have a PhD are a much larger number and that's a much larger talent pool. And the demand is going to, to drive this. And I know a lot of universities are starting up, um, um, PhD level programs for data science, certainly master level um, programs for data science. But that's, I mean, that's not, they're still not going to be able to produce enough. Right. I mean, the shortage is real. And I think we're just starting, we're just starting to get to the, the pinching point of that where it's not going to matter, um, you know, if you have the um, PhD or not. I think it's just, right. uh, clearly if you're going to be the, you know, chief data officer at Facebook, you know, clearly that person's going to need a PhD. If right. you are working on an autonomous vehicle project, probably going to need one or two PhDs to work on that one, right? Definitely. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, implementing the algorithms that, that research produces, um, you know, you're going to need someone with real world data experience, right? I mean, exactly. you, you could have someone who is a ninja rock star um, at, you know, statistics and, and, and mathematics, but don't know an ETL from an EMT. I mean, it's just <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's just like, you know, they, they wouldn't know what that is. And that doesn't surprise me that he would find people in that. Cause you, 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 you put that out there and, and, right. and there are a lot of people who are, you know, kind of in, 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 in your right. corner, not your physical corner of the world, but you're, you're part of the uh, industry who are, you know, basically DBA types and data engineers and data, you know, 
uh, data wranglers in your own right that would probably do really well in the data science uh, space. Well, that's what I'm seeing. You know, I'm seeing a lot of people with what we consider traditional business intelligence experience that are delivering uh, projects that are being classified as data science type projects. And um, as, as we sit here and, and talk, um, uh, SQL Saturday um, uh, Ireland is actually happening tomorrow. And today, uh, Buck Woody, uh, who I, I want to get on the show, uh, Buck did a pre-con, a day-long pre-con over at Microsoft Dublin, and he focused on R. And he was talking about, you know, the analytic side of this, which again is the is the deliverable, if you ask me. Um, and if I, you know, when I, I talk about data integration versus analytics, um, I like to put it in the context of, of building a house. So you hire a decorator and they come in when the house is built and they they say what goes where and they have that that great eye for visual and um, and for style. And that's what I see the analytics part of this field uh, doing. Um, I, I still see data integration as kind of like the plumbing, you know. So I spend a lot of my time being a data integrator, uh, working under the house. But I call myself a data philosopher because I get the role and the importance of the role, even though I can't personally perform it, or I can perform the role of visualization developer, but it's going to look like an engineer built it. Uh, so <laughs> I get that role and I do. Um, one thing else I'd, I'd like to say, Frank, before we move on is, so I've heard data scientists, uh, you know, the analogy that data scientists are unicorns. I think you may have coined a new analogy uh, with, with comparing them to zombies. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or I, that, that's really I, I, uh, the, the demand. You know, that represents the demand and the, you know, this is going to sound terrible, but the business line users, right? They don't care. Like at some point, it's not going to matter if you got a PhD from some prestigious university or some not as prestigious university. They're going to want to know, can I take the data that my organization sitting sitting on, say in CRM, and can we figure out something from it to turn a profit or to find a competitive edge in, in, uh, in our industry? I mean, that's ultimately going to be the driver of it. Right. You know, right. and and the, you know, getting back to something that Donald Farmer said, you know, uh, the data world used to be kind of a gatekeeper versus shopkeeper world. Right. And, you know, the, the wall, you know, getting back to the World War Z reference, you know, it's like, you know, that wall was kind of, you know, the typical data world. You know, it was very isolated from from the outside. And, you know, data is everywhere now, you know, and I think I think I think that's really a takeaway. I mean, at some point, you know. All these people who sit in the corner offices are going to realize that this data is here. Um, they already are in possession of it, but they have to do something with it. Right. Uh, and you know, this is really funny, right? So you mentioned, um, you know, data wrangling, right? So, mm-hmm. or cleansing the data. So I have, I was on a call with a potential client uh, not too long ago and I, and I used the term data cleansing and they took that, they actually took offense at it. Really? Well, because they, it wasn't, I wasn't talking to their data analytics folks. I was talking to more of their decision makers. Right. Um, they, they, they said, no, no, our data is clean. Wow. Like, and, and, and I, you know, I don't think they got, I think they took it as an insult, you know, like, right. you know, oh, your house is dirty. You know, no, 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 it's not quite what I meant. Cause even <laughs> if your data is in the most perfect format, um, for a relational database, right? I mean, if you, if you followed every best practice and standard that there are, the machine learning algorithms and the AI algorithms are going to expect the data to look a certain way. Right. And it has nothing to do with the, you know, cleanliness of the data. It has everything to do with uh, the shape of the data. So I've, I've, I've kind of taught myself, especially when talking to business folks, is to shape the data. Right. Uh, because there's no judgment there with shaping the data, you know. Well, and you know, Frank, I have, um, I've been doing this for decades now. I've been around data in one form or another. And uh, I didn't always do what I'm doing now, but I always found myself doing something like data integration with the data. I always wanted to collect it. I always wanted to perform some sort of analysis on it and then display the results of that analysis. And in saying that, you know, with decades of experience, I've not yet encountered anyone who has quality data. (laughs) It's, it's, everybody has skeletons in the closet. Everyone has um, data that's evolved. 
And, you know, you think about data acquisition, which is a huge part of, of you know, the, it's the root of the data science. Um, and people don't start on day one, um, you know, last year or years ago or decades ago even. And you get some insurance data. You get data from baseball, for goodness sakes. That was collected, you know, decades ago. They don't start collecting everything all at the same time. They don't go from zero to 100 instantly. And, and what you'll find, especially looking at these data sets, and I deal a lot with insurance and medical data, is there's just new fields that came into being, you know, three decades ago. <laughs> so right. There's no data. Exactly. It's, it's not that it's bad. It's just not there. And, you know, that is a data quality issue. And, it, you know, I hear what you're saying about data shaping. And it becomes a very important question. And part of what I think drives the, uh, the, your, your zombie analogy, and I was just pulling your leg, by the way, about this. I'm going to let it go. But <laughs> part, of what, part of what drives that unicorn analogy is, you know, you have to be good at, at, at three or four different jobs. And I mean, they're seriously, these are careers. These aren't just, you know, things you can go to school and study for, you know, 18 months and get a certificate and you can jump out there and start doing it. Um, I mean, everybody, everybody goes through that cycle and, you know, folks learn and stuff. But I mean, in order to do this well, you've got to have years of experience. You've got to reach senior level in, you know, three or four different fields. And, and data quality is one of those fields. And you think about this from a software perspective, right? Because I know you and I actually both come from the developer perspective. I was a software developer back before .NET. I was actually an MCSD uh, back oh, then. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, enjoyed it. That's kind of how I got started. And I, I fell into data almost literally. Um, but when you come at it from that perspective, especially in the last 20 years, all of our thinking from, say, the mid-90s on was all geared towards stateless, right, with the rise of the web. Um, and in some respects, even before the web, with just old end-tier architecture or even before that client server. If you could manage decoupling and stateless development, you were doing something really good. Um, you, com you compare that to data, which by its very definition is a collection of states, <laughs> <laughs> no. no, that's true. It's it's a very philosophically different world. In fact, one of the reasons, even though you suggested years ago that I should get into the business intelligence space, was it just had that, you know, as a developer, I had that, mm, I don't know if I want to deal with the data world. Right. Um, which was very short-sighted on my part, and I'm, I'm doing everything I can now to <laughs> to embrace <laughs> that. You'll get a kick out of this, so I'm not going to name him here, uh, but there's a mutual acquaintance of ours, Andy who uh, I spoke to last night on the phone okay. uh, about something else. And um, um, he was going for, he wanted to get my opinion of on um, something for an up, an impending interview he's doing. Cool. And, you know, he, you know, we kind of chatted for a bit and, um, you know, asked about what I was doing. I said, well, you know, I've been really, you know, hitting the, the data science world hard and, you know, taking, you know, courses in statistics and I passed the, um, oh yeah, that's another bit of news. I passed the, um, Certified Microsoft Data Analyst class, which is all about HD Insight and Spark and Hadoop. Um, yeah, did that. Did that in a month. So yay for wow. me. Um, yeah. I actually did that while I'm waiting for the final uh, capstone project to start in July. So, <laughs> um, so I was telling them all about it. I'm excited about it. Right? I mean, whenever I talk yeah. about data, I just can't con contain myself, and that that tells me that I'm on the right path. Yeah. Um, but as I was telling him, and this is a guy who's normally like excited about all kinds of technology, he, his his reaction was kind of like, eh, <laughs> like, like, eh, I don't want to do the data thing. Like, oh my god, like, was that me? <laughs> was that me? Like, you know, a couple of years ago, were <laughs> you, you weren't resistant to it, but I could tell when we talked about it, you didn't see what I saw, and not that I'm, you know, the Andy, the mystic guru, um, teller of futures and fortunes or anything like that. I just, uh, if if I have a gift. It's putting together teams, and um, a big part of that is recognizing what people would be good at. And the truth is, Frank, you know this. You've gone through this. I've gone through this. There's a cycle for that architects follow, and I, I like to classify it, and this is just me pulling a number out of the air, okay? I don't have any data behind this except my experience, but I see talented architects 
they'll start on something and they'll they'll dive into it. And part of the drive for them to succeed is this very virtuous cycle that is self-sustaining, that they're learning something new. And as they're learning something new, it excites them. And then they get to apply it. And oh my gosh, that's like throwing more gas. You know, you're starting the fire with throwing a little bit of gas on it. Now you're throwing jet fuel on it. Um, right. You know, and it's it's this for and and then it goes for about eighteen to thirty months, and they it's not that they've mastered it maybe or maybe they have, but they've certainly approached that level. They're definitely a senior at that point, and then they're bored. It's time to go find something else. <laughs> right. No. Exactly. I mean, uh, you know. But, but I mean, that over the long haul, I mean, you, you, to have somebody who's experienced in multiple disciplines, that, that's how they're created. Exactly. Well, that's where it's the unicorn the analogy comes right. from. And I think it's out. Um, it, you and I had a conversation about um, someone who was, was seeking your advice. They were looking for a person who was good at really just two of the disciplines that I consider part of that. And they, it turns out they were looking for someone good at the analytics engines um, at R and displaying you know, the output of the data analysis, being able to do the data analysis, the experiments part of this, you know, of science and data science. And they were also looking for someone to do the, the wrangling and the munging, which is more in my area. And, you know, they were, they really wanted senior level at both. And when you and I had the conversation, I think you were about 20 seconds into the explanation of what they were after. And I interrupted you and said, they're looking for two people at least. Right, right. <laughs> Well, I mean, you, you saw this too with, um, particularly in the DC area with the federal government. You know, they say they want a SharePoint architect, right? Oh so yes. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? I mean, a SharePoint architect. Very often they want. Do they want somebody to 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 do the development in SharePoint? Exactly. Do they want the person to do the infrastructure deployment. And when you kind of press them on that. The answer was, you know, yes to both. And it's kind of like, those are very rare people that do both. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. just, really? um, and, um, you know, personal thoughts and feelings on SharePoint aside, I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, infrastructure people and developer people tend not to be the same people. I mean, it's just, exactly. you know, um, you know, exactly. I'm sure there are exceptions and the exceptions are very well compensated. But uh, it is a rare animal that enjoys both and continues to do both. That's true. But, you know, I think as time goes on, we're probably going to see uh, more people who can do multiple disciplines. And, at the, you know, along with that, as we kind of increase in generations of languages, the languages themselves uh, are going to do, perform more operations. You know, we talked about the Microsoft data science uh, curriculum that, uh, that you and, and Kent Bradshaw, who works with me at Enterprise uh, data and analytics uh, can have been going y'all have been going through that and I think Kent's about to finish the last part he's almost ready for the capstone and um, you know at, Kent made this statement he said back when he learned statistics you know originally um, he, we had a, a deck of cards and a bag of marbles and a set of dice um, you know and now you have to know how to type a function in Excel um, and, and, you know, not that that's a bad thing, as long as you understand the underlying, um, the, you know, what, what STDEV means. Right. <laughs> you know? Otherwise, you can produce these really pretty pictures that are wholly inaccurate, um, and you can produce them really quickly. So, um, and that, you know, this, this whole idea that we're talking about, I think, is, is this gap where we're seeing um, the line between what Mark Tavadio aptly described as digital immigrants, which I think you and I are digital immigrants. Mark said he's a digital immigrant and, and digital natives. And I think about our kids, um, you know, my younger children and your children, Frank, are, uh, are digital natives. And it was amazing to me to watch my kids figure out iPads. Um, it took them no time at all. In fact, they were ahead of me and probably in about 15 minutes. Um, because of the intuitive design that, you know, that Apple had put into the iPad interface. Um, and I know you've had similar experiences. You've seen uh, kids you, you wouldn't have thought of, you know, we think like, you know, like raising our children, like we were raised where you get 15, 16 years old. Yeah. You can have a computer. No, my kids were using an iPad before they could walk. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and the funny thing is, is um, I remember 
you know, I had a Windows phone up until about a year and a half ago, uh, like a good Microsoft employee. Um, <laughs> and when we switched over to um, iPhones, we were at the store and the the guy there was basically showing us you know, how to use iOS. And we you know, we'd had iPads. Um, sure. But then he's like, if you triple tap, you know, this button, it shows you all the apps that are currently running. And my wife was like, who also works in technology, she looked at me and was like, oh, did you know that? To me. And I was like, yeah, Jake showed me. Jake being my <laughs> older son. Um, which is funny. And I think it also speaks to the, to the, the, the natural curiosity of children. Um, oh, sure. I think children have not yet been um, taught to fear failure. Right. That it's okay to explore. I mean, you go back to when, when I was younger, you know, it was always the kid that knew how to program the VCR. Right. Right. Um, is that because it was necessarily intuitive? Well, I don't know. Um, but I mean, certainly kids are more natural explorers. You know, they right. haven't been conditioned to avoid exploration because in explanation, there's a lot of failure. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think you nailed it with the fear of failure because kids fail way more often than they succeed. And that turns out to be the key to learning, um, no matter what age you are. And, uh, you know, that's that's why there's a lot of, of good good stuff out there about projects and success that include, you know, fail early, uh, fail often, and, and just keep trying stuff until you succeed. And there's something to that. And, you know, what I found is, that if uh, someone likes you, they'll describe that as tenacity or, you know, stick to itiveness. And if they don't, they'll just call you stubborn. Uh, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's a great point to end on because I know yeah. it's late over uh, in Dublin where you are. And uh, sequel Saturday, Dublin starts early. And um, so you've been listening to Frank and Andy. We are kind of philosophizing on on the first three weeks of our show and, and it's been a blast and we thank you, the audience for being part of this journey and, and really welcoming our podcast with, with open arms or open iPads or whatever. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for helping me.